In the build show today, guys, we are talking HVAC. In order to have a good heating and cooling system in your house, long before the installer shows up to install, there's some pre-work that needs to happen. And if you're a nerd fan of the show, you've probably heard me throw out the term manual J before. That's what the engineers produce for me, the builder, and for my HVAC guy, so that we know what's the size of system and what does that system need to provide to the house in order to heat it and cool it? So today, I've got a buddy of mine who's an expert in manual J's, Corbett Lunsford. And Corbett did the manual J for a project that I'm working on. This is actually for Luke, one of my project managers, his personal house. You may have seen some of the videos uh, about this house that we're building with ReadyFrame from Builders First Source. But Corbett and I are going to run through his manual J. We're going to give you a couple pitfalls, a couple things that you need to look for, and help you to understand what this looks like. Today's build show, all about manual J's and understanding them. Let's get going. All right, guys. First, let me introduce you to my buddy, Corbett. Corbett, how are you today, my friend? I'm great, Matt. How are you, man? Corbett, uh, help us to explain your background and and uh, others like you. You're basically an engineer who takes the plans and the specs and then turns that into this printout, this piece of paper, which we, which I call the manual J. But help us to understand what that kind of means in uh, in more plain language. Sure. Actually, uh, first thing that you should know is I am not an engineer. I oh, have okay. a degree in music. So um, I have been doing this for long enough and practicing with the software for long enough. And I like digging into the nerd level details, which I hope your uh, audience who's watching this is going to stick around to the end because there's like lots of stuff in here that's very interesting. But I uh, just, all you need to understand is number one, home is a system, right? You're, you're an expert in that. A lot of your audience understands that very well. So a manual J. All it really is, is figuring, uh, in short language, it's figuring out how much heating and cooling your any home needs on the maximum day. And maximum isn't really the hottest day it's ever gonna experience, it's the 99%. And that 99% is really important because if there's 8,760 hours in a year, and if you make a, your HVAC system sized so that it can handle the hottest day that you've got, then it's oversized 8,759 hours out of the year. Except for that one hour. So we don't really want to do that. Even if we've got two stage, you know, equipment or variable speed equipment, that's just not a good idea. So what you want to do is try and figure out what the maximum heating and cooling needed at the 99% day is. And then also understand that the manual J is really only about one moment. All we're aiming for in, in heating seasons, quite easy because the sun doesn't really help us much or hurt us much in the wintertime. It's Heat is bleeding out of the house. But in the summertime uh, in North America, in cooling season, you've got the sun beaming in through the west facing windows at about five o'clock in the afternoon. It's about as hot as it's going to get outside, and everybody's coming home and starting to make dinner. So that's kind of like that's your design hour that you're designing for is five o'clock in the afternoon on the hottest day of the year in the summer. And so when, when you talk about things like, oh, but what if I have a bunch of people over? Well, you always want to remember it's, it's at that one hour. So we, that kind of doesn't make sense. So anyway, that's all you need to understand for the basics. And then we can get into the, the details soon. That's really helpful, Corbett. So, um, so let me, let's back up a second. Before we got to this report, I needed to give you as the builder some information to make this report accurate. Can you kind of check checklist off? What are the things that I need to give you in order for you to input the data correctly to this software program that's going to output the sizing. Sure. Anybody who's going to do a manual J properly is going to need the floor plans with measurements. Um, and, and really all you're concerned about is the enclosure. That's another thing to understand about manual J is it, it doesn't really care about what's going on inside the house, partition floors, partition walls. It's all about the skin, the outer skin. And so somebody like me needs to know all the R values of your walls, your floors, your ceilings, the slab, the uh, bonus room floor, all that stuff. And then also things like the U value of the windows, the SHGC value of the windows, and also the air tightness. And this is where people who are watching your channel are, are way ahead of the game because you, they might know what, how tight of a building they build. A lot of builders are having to guess on this. And I, I, I'm about to do a video. I've got a list of like 30 videos that I'm looking at over my, my camera here. 
um, of what I need to address on our YouTube channel, which is called Home Performance. But one of them is how do you kind of plan for how airtight the home is going to be if you don't know if it's not built yet? So that's, we can talk about that another time, but that you know what kind of home you build. So we, we aimed this for two air changes per hour for this house, right? Yep, that's right. We, we knew we were going to be good, uh, but not the best ever really is, is kind of where I went with. So we said two ACH 50 code for our, um, for us in Texas is five. Uh, we typically shoot for three or under and with the air sealing details, with the way that we're doing a conditioned attic, we figured two ACH 50 was, was probably the right, um, landing spot. And let me give you just a quick background uh, for those of you watching here. Uh, this is a house that you've seen in framing already. This house is about uh, 4,000 square feet of uh, framed footage that includes the garage space. Uh, it's a two-story house. Uh, as you look at it from the front, it's one story on the kind of right-hand side. The left-hand side is two-story and is kind of the bigger volume. We've got uh, living space above the garage, or we're going to be using uh, spray foam in between that cavity to to help uh, mitigate the uh, both airflow and uh, the heat between the garage and that floor above. And this is a family home with uh, basically a, a husband and wife and and two girls living there. Uh, so that's kind of the quick background, just so you can kind of get a gauge for what the house looks like. We're using uh, Marvin Essential Line windows, uh, double pane really a good window, but not, uh, you know, triple pane, European, nothing crazy like that. We've got standard uh, two by six construction. We do have some zip R3 on the outside, and we're going to be insulating the roof line with about 10 inches of open cell spray foam to create a conditioned attic. So this is the plans that you sent me, the floor plans. You obviously also need the elevations and, um, and then the, all the details and kind of the wall cross section and things like that. And then of course, anybody who's doing this right is probably gonna come back to you with questions. Like for example, how big is the roof overhang and you know, things like that. So, so there's always one or two little things outstanding and they should ask. And then you get a report. Now here is what the report is gonna look like. Most of your clients are gonna get a report that is two pages. If they're lucky, it's three pages. You can see over here, we've got uh, two pages of data and then some like pie charts. So let me give you a quick tour through this. And I just wanna show you what you are probably going to see. So it's gonna have the name of the client, the address, who did this report, and that's important because you're gonna want that person's phone number. The reference city, you wanna check to make sure that that's right. Yep. You've got all your, uh, where the home is located because that's very, very important for this. A lot of this you know, calculation is based on the home where it happens to sit if it's on the top of a mountain versus in the valley where in the country etc you've got something called check figures which i'm going to come back to in a minute you got your building loads and you can see this is all very very brief you have notes that says this software that i'm handing you this report from is approved by aca for manual j s and d um, calculations are approved blah, blah 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 that stuff is all very important and then you're going to get a very simplified load preview report and what you want to see here in the first glance is room by room, because there's two kinds of manual J calculations. There's block load, which is just the skin that I was mentioning before that the software really cares about. And then there's the room by room. And really what you want is not just the skin. The skin is, if you're doing a change out on an existing home, then doing the block load is kind of useful for just knowing how big the air conditioner should be that you're replacing the older one with. But if you're trying to make sure that you divvy up the BTUs correctly where they belong within the house, you need this room by room calculation. You're just saying, oh, we're just going to give, there's five rooms, we'll give one fifth of the, the BTUs to each room. Doesn't make any sense because windows are now a big part of this conversation. And, and in fact, in this house, they're a particular big deal. So let's go back up to, oh, and by the way, the, um, the pie chart down here. Now these pie charts are important and these should, this should alarm you. If you're looking at this, um, we've got the floor sucking a lot of heat out in the wintertime, and we've got the ductwork losing a ton. Hmm. Um, in the summertime, we've got the ductwork losing a ton as well. And then the glass, obviously, is the big one in the summertime. So that ductwork Something's is part of why. What's that? Something's wrong here. Those ducts shouldn't be 40% uh, loss. This is a non-conditioned attic, I'm guessing, was, uh, was how you ran this. Did I, did I guess correctly? 
you are correct that this <laughs> report right. is total BS. This report that I'm showing you here is wrong. Um, what this is saying is that you need 6.72 tons. That's seven tons for a 3,000 square foot house. You're getting about a 500 square foot per ton, which is a, a metric that you know a lot. You, you've referenced that before in your uh, channel. And that's, that is rule of thumb sizing. So here's a couple things that I just want to point out about this report that makes it hack. Now, if you have a two-page report, my point here in, in opening this way is to like point out that, like, how are you supposed to know if this is right or wrong, if there's only this much information? Well, here's a few things that you can look at. So first thing is this right here, this winter and summer temperature, this is the 99% temperature, and you want to make sure that nobody has messed with those numbers. These numbers, if, if I was to open up my manual J software as just a guy who you call for a second opinion, and I pull up Austin Airport in Texas, it should tell me exactly the same numbers as your guy used for the report that's sitting in front of you. Gotcha. And so you could just, that's an easy way to double check this. But also over here, this person asked the homeowner or the builder what temperature they set their thermostat to hmm. in the winter and the summer. And that is a very wrong question. It's a, it's a trick that they use to slightly upsize. And the reason, by the way, I love HVAC guys. The reason that HVAC professionals are going to try and upsize this is because they very rarely work with builders like you who actually build the enclosure the way they say they're going to. So I built my own house and I know exactly, you know, I planned it and then I did exactly what I wanted to do. Most of the time you're dealing with a builder who doesn't, they might say they care, but maybe they don't care when it's like, is it time to give somebody a hard time or not? And then things happen and mistakes are made. And it's not a two air changes per hour. And a, you didn't use zip R, you used regular zip, et cetera, et cetera. So then their upsizing really helps because then they get the heat if anything goes wrong with the HVAC, which might be the builder's fault, yeah. not the HVAC's fault, right? That's right. So this should be 70 degrees in the winter and 75 in the summer. Always. That's the way that manual J runs. So if you see that, that's a dead giveaway that they, they mess some stuff up by asking, what temperature do you like your, your thermostat set to? Um, also, right here, if you take this volume, which is about 30,000 uh, cubic feet of air, and you divide it by your square footage. Now, the square footage of this house, as you see it when you're building this house, it, does that track about 3,000 square feet? Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. I mentioned it was 4,000 square feet because I, I want people to remember that as builders, we shouldn't be talking HVAC footage because I'm not building a 3,062 square foot house here multiplied by whatever your cost per foot is. I'm really building a 4,000 square foot house. We've got a 2.5 car garage. We've got a big back porch. We've got a big front porch. All told, this is a 4,000 square foot house we're building. Uh, and actually, I'm going to show you that it's actually a... 5,000 square foot house that you're building. There you go. In a minute, as, according to how Manual J sees it. But this, if you see the actual square footage, um, and then the important thing here is the conditioned attic. Mm -hmm. If you have a conditioned attic that you're building into your home, and you see the square footage that you are going to tell the tax assessor how many square feet this house is, that can't possibly be right. So if I divide my volume by my square footage here, I get a number between nine and 10. I've got 10 foot ceilings on the first floor, nine foot ceilings on the second floor. That can't possibly be right because it does not include the attic by definition. So even in a two page report, you can take a look at that and do that quick math and say, they didn't include the attic. Something's wrong. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Square footage per ton on a home that is like one that, that, that your viewers are seeing on your channel, that's going to be between 1,200 and 2,500 uh, square feet per ton. Anything less than that is suspicious. If you're looking at like a blower door less than three air changes per hour, well insulated walls, ceilings, floors, et cetera, there's no way that it can be that, that high. Yep. Um, and, I can, I'll, and I'll show you exactly how this works. Here's the big block numbers that you're looking for. Here's your heating load, 75. Your cooling load, 70. So it's about the same on both. And 6.7 tons, which really is going to round up to seven. This is all nominal. Nobody makes a seven ton air conditioner. Right. Nobody does anyway, but nobody makes like a five ton. Even They're all slightly different. So here's the thing on the preview report that's really important. You look at the ventilation and you can see that the ventilation load is huge. That probably means that they're not using something like an ERV mm -hmm. or, or they've overestimated how much air they're supposed to be bringing in here. Uh, or they're setting exhaust fans up to run 24 hours a day. 
So that's something that we want to look at. The duct loads, you can see we've got lots and lots of heat bleed through our ducts. The ducts are all inside conditioned space. There sh those numbers should be zero. There's a ton and a half of cooling just right there, isn't there? 18,000. Exactly, yeah, years. a ton and a half just for the ducts being in unconditioned space. That's, that's a really uh, awesome figure, though, if I could pause just for one second there. I mean, that's, this is why in Texas, in the South, anybody that's slab on grade where we've got ducks in the attic, for years I've been preaching about uh, we want to bring our ducks into the conditioned space. And it's awesome to see. I, you know, I know it intuitively, but I don't have, typically have a number. And now I've got in my mind Luke's house under construction and how much attic space is going to be up there. That if we were to build it conventionally with insulation on the flat at the ceiling line, we would have to upsize his air conditioning by one and a half tons, almost a whole two ton unit just for the issue of all that additional uh, gain from the ductwork being up in the attic. Right. So now let's be real. Let's go to what a real Manual J report should look like. This is 40 pages. Whew. And all I have to do when I'm building your Manual J is you tell me, please give me all the reports. Just check all the boxes when it's like, what do you want to print? Give me everything. Everything. Because they'll give you stuff that's not really that useful. That's okay. So uh, it'll, it, you, sh you should have a nice shiny logo that says, I am proud of this. Right, I, I did this and I'm proud of it. Uh, here are the same numbers that we had before, that 70, 75 yep. in, uh, set points on the thermostat in the winter and the summer. Square footage of room area is 5,300 when you include the, all the attic spaces. Uh -huh. And by the way, what's interesting here is that Manual J does an eight foot ceiling. So if you have 10 foot ceilings, it's actually counting that as square footage up to eight feet and then the square footage again on top of that, right? So that's kind of like, it's a little tricky when you look at that square foot, you might say, ooh, that, that looks really big. But, but again, you wanna kind of look at uh, what the, the uh, 3D model looks like. And somebody like me has to build this because I can't think properly. I used to do this without it, but um, this is what the house looked like when it was just 10 foot ceilings on the first floor, nine foot ceilings on the second floor. Wow, look at you, a little sketch up on the show it. Yeah. Oh, no, thanks. So, uh, I mean, this is something that I can't really work without because I need to get in here. I need to figure out what volume this is. Mm -hmm. I need to figure out how many square feet of wall and floor and ceiling, et cetera. You, you just can't really work this software without it. What Luke's house really looks like is this, as according to the Manual J. Now, uh, for those of you who are designing houses that are pretty, like Matt's company is, this takes a little more time. Like you can see this little, that little extra bit right there. You'd see this little dormer right there. And this all like just building the model took me two hours. Dude, really? Wow. Yes. So, so we need to talk about pricing on this because you can't expect anybody to do a good job with this and not really spend time on it. And that costs money, of course. Yep. Um, so now we know the volume of each of these big blocks. And we can add that up. So I can double check myself now. So we've got a volume of 40,000 cubic feet, square footage of 5,300. We're down to 3.9 tons, so four tons, down from seven, with it being wrong. And, and again, the wrong might still work. And that's the thing about all this system thinking stuff is that like, maybe nothing's gonna happen. But of course, what you specialize in is helping people predict and prevent problems from coming up. That's why you design solutions in and build them in and test to make sure that they actually work. That's right. So in the big report, here's the first thing that you're going to see that's useful. After you see your square footage and your, your CFM per ton, which, by the way, again, is 1,365 square foot per ton. 1,365, that's, there you go. Yeah, that's more like it. That's a Matt Reisinger uh, quality house. So in system one, we have the infiltration. This is You want to find this in this report because if they just set it to be a default, which is like average or semi-tight or leaky, it, nobody knows really what those means. I'm going to do a video about that too, trying to like suss out exactly what numbers those are. But I put in, you can see here in the blue box, the test air changes per hour, which was what I selected as the designer, is two air changes per hour. Hmm. Now that number only works if I've got the volume right. So you want to double check that volume again. But um, knowing that this is all put in here correctly is a big deal. Can I put Once that? Can I pause you for one sec? Because uh, because the software is giving you a a square footage in the house, which is different than what I'm thinking of as the builder, even though I'm always saying to people, hey, framed versus conditioned foot is different. But if I do the math in my head, I want to say the conditioned footage on this house is like 3,200 square feet, something like that. So if so, knowing that I need to get an air conditioner 
um, that's not 3.91 tons. It's going to be a four ton because that's going to be the closest to what it what it is. We're actually somewhere around eight, maybe 900 square feet per ton, which still makes sense. I'm usually thinking most of the time a well-built house should be a minimum of 1,000 square feet to the ton. So we're right in there. Well, yeah, and that's where you're kind of cheating yourself if you divide by that the square footage that's the, that's the CFA that you're putting on your plans mm -hmm. because uh, I, you know somebody like me is counting in the attics, which are conditioned yep. as yep. part of your square footage. So yeah, it'll look worse if you just divide by the 3,000 or 3,300 or whatever you've got in there yep. Um, yep. because it's... It's just not really how the house is going to work. Yeah. So you right. set up your enclosure. It's, it's always better, by the way, for your audience, which I hope they understand by now watching enough of your builds, that enclosing the attic, especially if you've got HVAC stuff up there, is so useful. That, that ton extra just for the ducts being located up there is pretty typical. Yeah, that's right. Great. So the load preview report is where you're going to, this is the thing that was in the two-page report. And you can see here where you've got your zones broken out. You can see the ventilation is a lot more reasonable now. It seems like it makes more sense. There's no duct loads in here anymore. And you can kind of look at each room and see how much uh, sensible gain, how much latent gain, that's humidity. Mm -hmm. So this is summertime, uh, heat and humidity added, and then wintertime, heat lost over here. And you can see if any particular room sticks out. We've got the kitchen is the biggest suck on the house. That's almost 7,000 BTUs per hour. Mm -hmm. So we, we wanna kinda like, let's look at that when we get down there. But um, the next report that you're gonna see is the duct size preview. Now when you s send this in for permit, this is important for people to understand. Uh, in a lot of states across the country, manual J, manual S, which is equipment selection, and manual D, which is duct design, are all required by law. Hmm. before you get your permit. Whether or not your local municipality enforces that is kind of beside the point. That's another discussion. Uh, but they're not really going to be able to select the equipment unless you're willing to say, yep, I've got a guy who is, I know is going to install this and I know this is the kind of brand he's going to install. So doing all that stuff before any change orders happen on the house, you couldn't get web trusses. Now we have to use iJoists. Duck design just changed. If the duct design changes, are we going to change the equipment selection while we're at it? So, so all that stuff might want to wait until you're actually under construction and framing. But for right now, you need to put in something. And so if you give your building department a 40-page report on HVAC design, they're going to look at this and say, yeah, this looks right. I've got two six-inch ducts running to the entryway. I've got one five-inch duct running to the office, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of like your duct preview if you were just going to take this and run with it. Now, that being said, this is not a manual D. Uh, what I'm showing you right here. Okay, so AED. This is something that's important for people to understand. This is called adequate exposure diversity. It basically has to do with where the windows are in the house. If you've got windows uh, placed strategically and consistently around the entire building, then you'll have an AED that's, that's adequate. Uh, this house happens to have a lot of glass on sides of the house that are more vulnerable to the sun, particularly on the west side mm -hmm. and the southwest. Because of the facing. And, and this is where, like, I'm not going to argue with it because, yes, we're, it's warning us that certain parts of the house are going to react differently at certain times of the day, particularly at 5 o'clock p.m. You can see the spike right here. But it's only 1,600 BTUs per hour. That's about a tenth of a ton. So Not terrible. Mm, it's not that bad. If you, if you were going a ton above, that means you have to install a ton extra air conditioning just because you put the windows where you did. Yeah. So that's something that you want to look out for. But... Uh, in this case, not a huge deal. There's a thing that we can look at where we're rotating the building. Hmm. So it, it turns out that the way that the front door is facing right now, which is northeast, it's here, is the third highest uh, sizing that we could have on the house. If we were to face the, the front door south, directly south, that would be the best for keeping the HVAC sizing minimal. Wow, interesting. So you can kind of look at this, and this is important for a builder like you to look at because if you're going to build this house again and again, which I don't think you do, but somebody like Scott True in one of your prior, you know, prior videos, he builds the same plan a lot and knowing which way is the best way to situate that house. And then easily, you could, you could have the same house plan, get one manual J, get this, and then you've got the sizing for all of your plans. No matter which way you turn the house, you know what sizing is required. And it's a half ton too. That's a big deal. I mean, that's Correct. that's uh, or actually a little more than a half ton because you're gonna have to probably size up on that highest one above four tons. So it's uh, it's significant money involved. Potentially, yeah. 
and and then also but there's airflow which is a, another topic mm -hmm. um you can see what the room by room gain or excuse me this is the house facing all the different directions the one that we've what we actually are building is this red line with the uh, purple triangles and you can see how it stacks up against all the other ones you can see all of them basically climb and they peak at this five o'clock hour which is again that's the hour that we're designing for in this software yep that's the hottest part of the day yep so this is the thing that i n almost never see inside of a, a manual j report that's submitted by an hvac installer you want to see what assumptions they made. So now I can go through here just as a builder. This stuff is not rocket science. And I could look and see if their U-value and SHGC for their windows is what I told them that it was. Or if they picked a library item that, oops, was the next one down on the list accidentally. And mistakes get made. Like, this is hard. So uh, we've got all of your walls in here. We've got your floor slab on grade, no insulation. And we'll see what difference that makes in a minute. We've got the partition floor over the garage. We've got the roof. Now here, you can look at the people. This is a four bedroom home, you got five people. That's pretty standard, bedrooms plus one. Equipment should be minimal. It should be around this 1600 is, is basically your kitchen equipment. So that's refrigerator, cooktop, vented uh, exhaust hood. Gotcha. That's standard. You don't wanna see that really big. Lighting should be zero. And, and this is where I, I went the first time I built one of these uh, models, I went totally awry. So I put in all the lights because the guy said, I have LEDs everywhere. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. I've got them in the closet, et cetera. And I was like, okay, great. I'm going to put all that in there because I want to make sure that we cover you. But I forgot that this software is only designing for five o'clock in the afternoon on the hottest day of the year, which is in the summertime when the sun is shining. So you're not going to have the lights on at that time. I mean, you might have some of them on, but it's really not going to make that big of a difference. Yeah. So zero is the right answer there. Ductwork zero. Infiltration. Again, we, we specified the blower door test. Ventilation. We've got this specified. And these numbers are what the ASHRAE 62.2 minus your infiltration, the accidental air leakage through the gaps and cracks that are left over in that two air changes per hour. That's what that 43 is then accounting for. And, uh, and just to pause you there for a second, we told you, Corbett, to assume that we were going to use a ventilating dehumidifier to bring in uh, air through the dehumidifier and into the return side uh, of the unit. So <laughs> not quite as uh, good as what an ERV would be in terms of uh, lowering the load on the house, uh, but certainly better than an exhaust-only type strategy. Right. And unfortunately, this software, as far as I understand, can, does not have the ability to build that ventilating dehumidifier in. So what we did is I just put in, it's going to be a little bit better than this as far as the latent goes, because it's obviously going to drop the humidity as it comes in. Yep. But that 43 is the right answer. So every, every minute you need 43 CFM. That means that if you're going to run it at 86 CFM, you only run 30 minutes on the hour. Yeah. Uh, um, to open that other damper on the ventilating dehumidifier. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so total building loads, you can see all that stuff right here. Bam. And then your check figures are the same. Now, here's, your, here's the thing. Your slab floor, this is really interesting to me. In Austin, you've got 41% of the heat loss through this enclosure lost through that slab. It's crazy. It's mostly the slab edge, but also that very beginning of the edge there. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why I ended up doing a uh, insulated slab top insulation at my house was I've seen that pie chart enough times to realize that in the winter time you lose a lot of heat through your uninsulated slab on grade. Almost yeah. half your load is from the floor, just shy of half your load. What's what's interesting here though is check this out. So we got 45,000 being lost. Mm -hmm. We've got 38,000 being gained. Yep. Normally um, heat pumps are set up to heat a little bit more than they cool. And you're actually getting a benefit from the uninsulated slab in the summertime. That's right. So this generally, if you're not building the kind of house that Matt built for his own family and that I built for my own family, that's an extreme, you know, story we're trying to tell, then insulating under the slab is the last thing that you do because decoupling from the earth uh, helps you in the wintertime, but it hurts you in the summertime. Yep. And so it's like not the end of the world here. This is actually kind of a good thing. Corbett, one point I want to make here, though, is that for years and years, really decades, 99% of the homes in America either had no manual J or had a manual J kind of baked into the HVAC contractor's design build bid. And usually that meant that the HVAC contractor was having uh, the dealer do the manual J, uh, you know, where they're buying their equipment. 
And what I've been trying to tell my friends, my family, and my audience over the years is you should pay for Emmanuel J separately with somebody like Corbett, or you've seen me uh, have the positive energy guys in Austin on the podcast before, or, um, you know, there's a bunch of people that, that will do this for you as, you know, smaller companies, even one man shows like Corbett, but you should absolutely do that so that you know that they're taking the time to actually get the specs and the plans. And now that we've gone through this, and I, I've seen Manual J's a bunch. I, I honestly forgot, even though I've seen this, it's been a while, how much time and effort Corbett put into this Manual J to make it accurate. And you look at the data that he's using on his Elite uh, software here. Uh, I think there's two different software companies, Writesoft and Elite, that produce this. There's a lot of inputs here, and you heard him say it took two hours just to do that SketchUp model to, to truly understand that this is this is easily a day or two's worth of work for Corbett, uh, and then time like this afterwards for us to review it together is excellent as well. He didn't just send me the report and say, here you go. We're taking the time to look at it together, and he's given you some really good tips to, uh, of things to look for to make sure that the report looks good, but this is vital. This is really important. And with that being said, Corbett, what what I know there's a huge range, and I hate to pen you down, but what should people expect to pay for a manual J in a house? Most homes that I work on are between a thousand and two thousand for what I'm doing, and yeah, it's like basically an entire day in front of a computer. So a couple things to think of are like number one, no matter who you have do this, and again, I am not an engineer. I QC manual Js from other people, including professional licensed engineers. Mm -hmm. Um, especially ones that work on commercial mm. projects. Mm. And that is very dangerous. You should be very cautious about that. I, I recently had a client who has like a 12,000 square foot house that they're building in <laughs> New York, 40 tons oh my. of air conditioning. Wow. From a professional engineer. The, the plans looked amazing, so intimidating. But I could go in and find the few pieces of information that I want to know and be like 40 tons for 12,000 square feet doesn't make any sense at all. Like that, it's not even in the, on this planet. Um, so what you can uh, do is just make sure that you, you or somebody that you trust looks over this stuff. And, and it, before I send it out, I try to look over it. If I had an employee, I would have my employee look over it. Yeah. If you want to have another consultant uh, look over the, the manual J that you got from somebody else, that's very easy to do. So that's kind of like what, you know, all of us are trying to educate people through YouTube on how to do this stuff better. And I think that it's pretty easy to find people now who can just give you a second opinion on any of this stuff. Corbett, before we, uh, before we roll off on this topic, what would you put in this house, uh, knowing that we're uh, 3.91 tons? And talk to me about what other equipment I might or might not want uh, in a house when it comes to HVAC for the South, based on your report. Well, the first thing that I would say is, I ran the model with an insulated slab. If you put R10 along the slab edge and under the slab, mm -hmm. you would lose a ton uh, off, uh, not a ton, but 12,000 BTUs off of the heating. Off the heat load. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So that, that's not necessary right now, but uh, that's something to just think about. Um, the short answer is that what needs to happen next is the equipment selection, which is the manual S. And that actually, for somebody like me, and this is a question I get a lot, how can I get you, third party, whoever in some other state that I trust to do my manual J, S, and D? And the short answer is don't ask me to do your duct design for you. Because if I build this duct design and I select the equipment and I like, you know, I have Mitsubishi in my house. So I, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's the one that I think is cool because I like, I have in my house. Then you get a guy who is a train dealer or a carrier dealer. And he likes to install that stuff. He's never, he would have to read the whole manual to really do the Mitsubishi right. He doesn't want to do that. So yeah. he's going to upcharge you for that. Um, what's better is to get your HVAC contractor that is somebody that you trust, that you've worked with before, and you know that is huh, uh, both willing to be open to new things like a very low load. You know, it, it, we're looking at, you know, a 12,000 square foot house that has four tons of cooling instead of 40. And that can make HVAC guys nervous, but if they're willing to do it, then that's great. Then they say, here's the product line that I like to install. And here's the particular, you know, performance, uh, line or the, the budget line from that. Yep. 
And then I can put that number into the manual S and see if it says yes or no. So that's a yes, no calculation on the manual S. And then for the duct design, if they do the duct design because they know what kind of materials they like to work with, duct board in the Southeast, flex duct all over the place, hard pipe if you want to build more permanently. That's what I did in my own system because I wanted it done like for a hundred year system. Then I don't have to say, I want you to install all hard pipe. And they're like, I don't do that. I don't have the tools for it. Yep. And then they just throw the calculation in the garbage and it's worthless. Yep. So you, you have them do the duct design give you the map, and then somebody like me can do the calculation to figure out what diameter the ducts need to be to deliver the stuff that you need to the right places. So, so that's kind of the best collaboration between the HVAC installers who are critical to this conversation and the designers who potentially are somebody like me, some super nerd who works by himself in some other state that you've never heard of. <laughs> so you don't want the HVAC guy to hate your designer. You want them to be working together. That's really important. Uh. So good, Corbett. Really appreciate this. Super, super thoughtful, man. I think uh, people watching this have certainly learned something about manual J's, and I suspect will apply this knowledge uh, to their next build, uh, whether that's one that's currently under construction or the very next one they're about to break ground on. Corbett, how can people learn more from you in the future? How do people find you? Sure. Uh, we'd love it. So we have a YouTube channel called Home Performance. We also have a television show that uh, you are on season two of that's airing around the country right now. You can stream it's on that PBS. on the website. It's on PBS. That's right. It's called Home Diagnosis. So if you go to homediagnosis.tv, you could, you could binge watch uh, season two that's got Matt in several of the episodes. And then also, um, I have a whole bunch of courses that are rolling out online. I've been teaching in person, but getting people to fly across the country, especially with pandemic, is ridiculous. So we've, we even have an HVAC design course where I dive into nerd level 16 on this topic. Um, we also have one day blower door and duct tightness testing certification courses and stuff like that. But I try to do as much um, of this stuff myself because we don't have employees. And I like to have a personal relationship with all the people that I work with. I didn't with. know there was a nerd level 16. That's impressive. That's higher than Thank I've you. ever gone. We're, yeah, we're trying to we gotta push the envelope. Man. I've topped out at 10, Corbett. So you beat me for sure. Guys, I'll put a link uh, to all of Corbett's places where you can find him in the description below. But thanks for hanging for us uh, on this longer build show, a little abnormal, uh, almost podcast style. I thought about doing this podcast style uh, with Corbett, but I felt like uh, him reviewing and showing, and he did such a great job of kind of highlighting, I thought that was really necessary. And I wanted this to be an episode where it's almost as if you sat down with the two of us uh, and looked at this report together. And I think I think it's particularly cool, too, that we're making additional videos uh, on Luke's house so that you can see this house go in. Stay tuned for the future video. As we get to the HVAC system, we're going to be uh, making some videos on that as well. But huge thanks, Corbett. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time for us. Guys, if you're not currently a subscriber, hit that subscribe button below. You know we've got new content here every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow us on Instagram or TikTok. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Oh! Build Show.